after I had started the Buffalo History Channel in March of 2020 and um, really began to realize that it was going to be more than just a place for me to archive my work. Um, and after I put up some of the documentary work that I had already done with doing the work on Build and, and Model Cities, uh, I knew that if I was going to start to present more stories, um, I pretty much knew that it wasn't it wasn't going to be able to be at the same level as the Build series was, or as or even like Model Cities was. Um, they were going to have to be in stories that are presented in more of a short form sense in more of a maybe news package type of, it would have to have a more news package or news feature type of feel to it. So that's really the origin point of how the thought of original productions for the Buffalo History Channel had come up. And, um, in thinking about that, I also knew that it couldn't really be just on anything. I mean, I really tailored the, I was going to start to tailor the Buffalo History Channel platform to be more, um, the stories would have to be unique. They would have to come from various angles, you know, I mean, every, it couldn't be, it couldn't be the same thing time and time and time again. And I wasn't sure how many I would do or how often they would be put on because it would be something that would not only require, it would, it would still be similar to how I would have done the documentaries where it would require re, a, a tremendous, a, a certain amount of research, a, a certain amount of reading, a certain amount of, materials and visual aids to make it visually appealing and tell a proper story to engage the viewer. So um, in thinking about that, um, I tried to figure out what stories could I really lock in on. You know, it's, Buffalo has so many stories and it's, history you know I knew the stories would have to be compelling you know it would have to really be something where you know you come onto the platform or you're scrolling on social media on some of the other media platforms that I have it on and I have my posts on and it would have to make people stop and look you know like hey this is this is an interesting story. I mean, it's maybe something, it could be a story of where you, you might have, of something that you might have known about. But you know what something is, but you don't know the story behind it. So that's the angle that, and, and of course, when you're, when you're in this type of work and you're doing the type of work that I've been doing for over 20 years, you realize that from a presentation standpoint, as well as a filmmaker, content creator, whichever title it is, there's so many titles out there now, you realize that not every story will particularly warrant being put out there as a full-length documentary event. You know, it might be a more shorter-form story. I mean, you, can, you don't need several hours or an hour or so to tell any particular story. You can, you can even on the, the news stations do it all the time. You can tell that story in maybe less than a minute, you know? So that's really where the idea overall for the um, original productions on the Buffalo History Channel to, that's where the idea of it came about. And uh, it's proven itself with the last, uh, five productions to be 
a cornerstone of the entire platform. My own connection with the uh, Apollo Theater is, um, as a whole, has been somewhat um, interesting, to say the least. I mean, if you know my story on the professional end, you know that I was involved with public access for a long time. I was a, not only a producer going all the way back to the original Sunship Communication, BPAC, BPAC days, and other operators after that. Uh, but I was also, in the, late, in the late 90s, I became a staff member of the Apollo, of not the Apollo, but of public access. And um, the way that I got connected with it was when I first came on staff at the public access station, within about a week of me being there, it had been brought to my attention that uh, there were plans underway to move public access from its location, which was at 89 LaSalle Avenue, to uh, Jefferson Avenue. And it was going to be inside the Apollo Theater that they were going to be finally revitalizing after many years of sitting dormant in that area. And uh, I can remember at the time being really excited about it. You know, I mean, it was, I, mean you know, I, I, thought, I thought it was great. You know, the public access itself was, it was going through a lot of momentum at the time in the community. And... Uh, I felt that being up in that being up in that situation would be like a win-win, and I was I was eager to, you know, coming on staff for the very first time, I was eager to do whatever I could to help out and be a part of it. Well, that's where it got weird because I was told that I could not be a part of it. I'm not going to say by who. I'm going to be nice and leave that part of it alone. But, and I, it was strange to me because, you know, I'd come over there to help. And I will admit that I felt some kind of way about it. <laughs> you know, and um, I, it, it's really a... That part of it is really a long story and quite a bit much to get into. And I won't do that at this juncture. But I will say that um, as time had went on, I took it upon myself, not just during the time of my employment, my short employment at Public Access, but for many years after that to um, educate myself on, you know, being a not just a filmmaker, but also a res I've also been a researcher. I'm, I'm really good, at, been a good researcher, if I do say so myself. And I took it upon myself to do some research on what the Apollo was. And I, you know, I've, it, you know, I went through a lot of, you know, public access was in a downward, in a downward period. So you know, you had a lot of boxes laying around because we were at at one point housed in Langston Hughes Institute, and I went through a lot of boxes while we were there and. They had a lot of documents and stuff laying around. And I read up on a lot of those documents and what the Apollo project was supposed to be and what the intent of it was going to be. And I also stumbled across, within that those boxes, I stumbled across a, a videotape of, the, of a press conference that was held in September of 1995. And that, at that point, they were doing like a whole feasibility study because they didn't know what they were going to call it. Was it going to be a community center for the arts? Was it going to be a public access TV station? Or was it going to go back to being a, a neighborhood theater? You know, so we all know what it became. But as I was developing the Buffalo History Channel, I had this uh, epiphany as I was looking for content to put on the channel. You know, 
for for up to up to this point, you know, everybody knows about you know, the Apollo Theater as it stands as a telecommunication center, but very little has been said over the years about how it stood and what it was originally as a movie theater in the heart of the Cold Spring black community, you know. So I th it was then that I thought that this might be a good kickoff. You know, I mean, I, I had collected over the years an, a, a litany of material on the Apollo. And I did, when I came back to Buffalo from Maryland on a vacation or a break from work, I decided to go into the library and pick up some, pick up some early materials of going all the way back to the 1940s when the when the the Dipson brothers ran it. So I'm when it went from the Dipson brothers to the Moss brothers. So collecting all that information and putting all that together in a uh, short feature served as a uh, wonderful an ideal kickoff to this original production project or endeavor for the Buffalo History Channel platform. And uh, it turned out to be, posted it and turned out to be quite successful, worked out really, really well. Um, I remember I, I had a hard time. I wanted to make contact with the Moss Brothers. And I was asking around and Strangely enough, nobody seemed to have any information on their whereabouts, you know. But luckily, maybe a few months, about, about a month or so after I had put the piece online, uh, I received a um, inbox on Facebook from Roger Moss. And he, he enjoyed talk, tell me how much he enjoyed the piece. And he said if I was interested in having, getting more information to contact him. And I said, I immediately sent him a message back and said, yes, <laughs> I want, yes, I definitely want to have you on. So I called him and we talked about the Apollo and, and I'm, I'm like, man, I got to have you on. I had him, he contacted his brother Raymond and was, I, as you people know, I was able to have the both of them on the platform and do a follow-up piece, a part two of the Apollo story and have those, have those brothers on to talk about talk about their uh, their experience and running the Apollo and people can go on go on to the platform and look up look up both videos and get that information so uh, that served as a wonderful kickoff to what's become somewhat of a tradition now on the uh, Buffalo History Channel the Apollo theater story was the first original production to appear on the Buffalo History Channel. Anytime you do something for the first time and you know you're planning a sequel or a follow-up to something that you've done, the hardest thing is to figure out what you're going to do. And I knew I wanted to do stories that were unique and uh, something that would be eye-catching, something that would be compelling, something that would pique someone's interest. I don't know how it came to be, but I had this bright idea to do one, do a, do a second original production on the story of a supermarket in Buffalo that went by the name of Figmo's. Figmo's, uh, the name was actually, as everybody knows, was an acronym. It stood for, finally, I got my own supermarket. Praise the Lord. There were two, there were three additional let letters. It, the full name is Figmo's PTL, and PTL was praise the Lord, so you put it all together. Finally, I got my own supermarket, praise the Lord. For me, my connection with Figmo's is really not much of a connection. I mean, uh, at that time, 
I was about, what, 9, 10, 11 years old around that period of time that it was open. Um, I've only been inside Figmo's maybe, um, I'd say maybe once, twice, maybe three times. We didn't, me, we being my mother and father, we did, they didn't really go to Figmo's, but my, my grandparents did. They lived within that area. And uh, I can remember going there a few times with my grand, when, when, when I was with my grandparents and my grandfather and grandmother, they would drive, drive over there and do some, they did some of the grocery shopping there from time to time. So when I would be with them, I mean, there were a few times I walked, was inside the supermarket no, I don't know nothing that really stuck out. Nothing for me to sit here and really romanticize or whatever. But it was from to me, it was no, no different from any other supermarket. Um, the only thing that really stood out to me with Figmo's was, other than its name and what it stood for, uh, was its commercial. They had some very uh familiar commercial jingles. Uh, famously, it was sung by the Gales family singers. Um, they, were, they had many uh, commercials on the radio. So it wasn't open that long. And uh, there, was a, there was a struggle. I, I did know that it was a struggle, to, that the owner really struggled to keep it open and keep it afloat and keep it on its feet. And under the pressure, it pre eventually um, went out of business. But um, for the short time that it existed, it still remains a uh, memory in the community. I mean, me views on it have been mixed over the years. Uh, some some kind of laugh about it. Some say they didn't think much of it as a business, and some. When we, when I produced a piece on it, um, I did reach out to Mr. Goggins. I didn't get a response. I don't, I'm not sure if it was it was on, through Facebook, so I'm not sure how often he was on Facebook. So I never really heard from any family members on it. Um, but I did produce a piece. It was a Figmo's a supermarket story, and what as I did the research on it. Um, what was most interesting and intriguing was the fact that the owner, Douglas Goggins, actually had had a connection with um, the supermarket, the top supermarket, which opened in uh, 72 in the Town Gardens Plaza. And he, I forgot what his uh, position was, but he, he was in an overseeing position towards the, the Topps market. And then he went on to run the Figmos. And I just found that I didn't know that. So I just discovered that as I did research. And I hadn't planned on including uh, the Topps market in the Town Gardens Plaza as a part of that story. But once I saw that, saw what his connection to it was, there was a, a, a kind of a bridge, a bridge there, you know? So I didn't feel like I could ignore it. So it kind of was, it kind of turned out to be a two for one. That's why it's called a supermarket story. Because we're actually talking about two supermarkets with one connector being Douglas Goggins. The story starts out by first highlighting the Topps Market with, with the owner, Carl Mackin. And it goes to Douglas Goggins. I mean, a lot of people look at it today and they tell me that it's a, overall the piece was a, a inspiring story of black empowerment. So I was glad to see that something positive overall was able to come out of that story. If ever there was a cornerstone, something that um, stood the test of time on Jefferson Avenue, something that was a staple, you know, a community staple, I would have to say that it would be Jim Bell Cleaners.
my own connection to Jim Bell Cleaners, mom and dad always took, when I was growing up, they, all, we, they always took our clothes to get clean there. Interestingly enough, I never met the man. Believe it or not, I never met Jim Bell. Knew his brother, met his brother Cliff. Actually, when I was a um, staff member at Public Access, one of the things that I had intended to do was meet up with Mr. Bell and interview him because he's one of the biggest main black businesses that I've always known about all of my life. And I, it was right on the heels of me doing the Bill, Bill documentary and I was doing producing a show called B, a community program called BCTV Tonight and I was going to interview him as a feature. I wasn't at public access very long and that did not happen. So, and then later down the line, uh, sadly, he uh, passed away. So obviously that interview never happened. Right as I finished doing the, uh, the original production on Figmos, it immediately popped into my head. As I, was, I remember as I was researching Figmos, I also picked up some information on Jim Bell Cleaners. I've always had the film footage of when Jim Bell Cleaners first opened, which was in 1971, a few months before I was born, interestingly enough, by the way. And um, I was finally able to, uh, I was happy to finally be able to put, put that story to the film that I had and kind of bring that full circle. Um, but like I said, my parents used to bring their dry cleaning to them all the time. And I used to sit in the car and wait for them to come out. And I remember he had these um, murals on this other building on the side. It was there for years. It's not there anymore, but it was there for many, many years. And I remember as I was putting it together, I connected on Facebook with his daughter, Kathy Bell Dillon. And I remember when I first connected with her years earlier, I always told her I was going to do a video on Jim Bell Cleaners. And I was finally, finally with the creation of this platform, it enabled me to finally bring that to fruition. And uh, I, was, I originally wanted to interview her. And she said she's camera shy, but, but what she did was she gave me a written narrative of information on her father, and she sent me a number of never-before-seen photographs of her father, and I was able to, with research, pick up, pick up a lot of information and photographs of Jim Bell Cleaners, as well as his brother Cliff's Bell Brothers Cleaners, and uh, some even pictures of him starting out tailoring as a teenager. So it really, so really to put that together was, it was a joy to put, an honor to put that together. It was a one, turned out to be a wonderful piece as well. And um, something that I was, that's one of, that, that's actually one of my favorites. It was something that I was really happy and proud to put together and Many of them, happy to say, many of the people that watched it were happy, happy to have watched it. And I'm sure they were happy I put it together as well. <laughs> I can recall during a few conversations um, from time to time, not a whole lot, there would always be mention of um, whenever we would talk about Juneteenth, there are some that would always try to uh, dispute that the first Juneteenth on Jefferson Avenue did not take place on Jefferson Avenue, that the first Juneteenth actually took place on uh, Fillmore Avenue. And it would always, even I would look at them like they were crazy, like, what are you talking about, <laughs> you know? And... These, they, they, it wouldn't happen a whole lot, but every now and then somebody would bring that up. And I never had any documentation on, the, on anything about a Juneteenth festival happening long before 1976 in Buffalo. 
and happening somewhere other than on Jefferson Avenue. But um, I can recall last year, it was over the, I'm not sure if it was, was it over the summer or either, either the summer or in September when I was in the library doing research, I stumbled across uh, this whole spread of a summer festival that took place in 1972 on Fillmore Avenue. For the record, it was not called Juneteenth. It was called Fillmore Unity Day. And it was started by the, um, spearheaded by the uh, Fillmore Businessmen's Association and business group. And um, when I, as I was reading it, because it really caught my eye, the, the, the images, really, it was a, a whole spread of images and photographs, and it really caught my eye. And um, I, I said, I started, then it really occurred to me then, okay, this must be what they were talking about. So, okay, so what I'm, I, and I, I, I had enough information, and I decided right then and there that we just found our fourth original production on Fillmore Unity Day of 1972. And, you know, posted it up and, uh, Interestingly enough, I was surprised at how many people actually remembered being there and enjoyed that day. So, I mean, it, Buffalo has actually, Juneteenth was not really the first summer festival to take place in Buffalo as a whole. Um, you've had, um, and I don't even know if this one would, but I'm going to say was the first, uh, but you had another festival in the, in the late 60s called Black American Day, which was put on by the uh, Black Development Foundation. I'm not sure if that was the first. I don't want to even get in. I don't know if it was or was not. Was not. I don't even want to, I don't even want to get into it. All right? I don't even want to get into it. But uh, again, it turned out to be a uh, really uh, good piece as well. And that was the fourth original production. Well, first of all, I am from television. People will assume that I am from radio. My origins were not in radio. I want to be very, very clear on that. My origins were not in filmmaking <laughs> either. <laughs> My origin actually was in television. Television was the main thing that I had gotten into once I got into college. Um, I spe more specifically, I wanted, I was intending to go into commercial production and television programming. You know, the person that's, that puts the TV, that's responsible for putting and deciding what goes on across the TV airways for those that did not know. So, between that and now I never really for the record got to really do any of that so I wound up doing other things instead and uh, you know so the filmmaking and radio and all being radio jock and all that stuff that all of that was by happenstance to be perfectly honest with you I mean be it a good thing or a bad thing that's the that's just simply the way it worked out as someone who's in the business and as someone who has an has a interest in, and a passion for history and research, it's only natural with all the work that I've been doing on Buffalo's history that I would certainly make a venture into talking about the history of Buffalo black media through television. Uh, if you've watched most of my work, you already know that I've done extensive work on Buffalo's media history 
through radio, in particular, WUFO, which you know today is Power 96.5 FM. Um, I will tell you, historically, <laughs> that um, my first intent to really, I had intent, the soul of Buffalo TV, the concept for that actually came about in the nine in 1998 when I was working at public access and um, I was going to um, make that into a on my show BCTV tonight my community show BCTV tonight I was gonna make that into a full full-on feature news feature series and it was gonna have a multitude of stories I was going I started off at the time by doing a feature, doing various features on some of the original Buffalo Public Access pioneers from the Sunship Communications days. And, um, but as I said before, my employment with Public Access did not last. So that wound up getting cut short. So the only interviews I shot were the only interviews that were seen. Well, actually there were a couple that I sh would shoot later that actually did not get seen at that time. But they get they got seen on like with for for example with Aviva Merritt, that you saw on the Buffalo History Channel. Uh, I also was going to go from I I started to go from highlighting the people from public access to highlighting people in the print media. I had shot an interview with uh, Ron Fleming from the um, Fine Print News. You can see that on the Buffalo History Channel. I shot an interview with Alnisa Banks from the Challenger. You can see that interview on the Buffalo History Channel. I had not gotten around at the time to Frank Merriweather. Of course, we can do that in the future from the Criterion. So, uh, but like I said, my employment at Public Access had ended and I really hadn't done much follow through on that because I, rem and I, I actually was going to start to reach out to WBLK and get some of the WBLK jocks on there. But interestingly enough, and this is just a little tidbit here, something that you didn't know, uh, I was uh, I was going to reach out to them and have them on on BCTV tonight, but it was just, it just so happened that um, in November of 1999, I run into Catherine Roberts and she introduces me to, to Skip Dillard and that meeting leads up to me getting a job, getting my first job in radio. But again, that's a whole nother story. That's just, I just thought I would put that in there. That's just, just some, just an interesting tidbit of information in case you did. Just something that you didn't really know. Uh, so over the years, I had just had a, collected a lot of information on different uh, Buffalo media figures. And uh, as I was starting to research some stuff for the um, Buffalo History Channel, I looked through some of the old Challenger articles. I stumbled across a lot of ads because what was interesting, and I, ha I hadn't intended to do it like this, but I could. Re but ba I remember that back in the day, you had a number of black-oriented television shows going all the way back to the 60s, the late 60s, that focused on black community issues. It had black hosts, had black people on the set, on, behind the scenes. They dealt, they dealt with black stories. They had black guests. They were, these were like really black, pro-black pro -black shows that would, they were... And they were very popular shows, and they were there were a, a bunch of them back in the day. You had um, Basic Black, you had Afro Central, you had um, Buffalo Beat, Urban Focus, and even a few that I didn't know about. I mean, as I was doing my research, I stumbled across information on what the first one actually was, which was a portrait of my people, which was hosted by Malcolm Erni, who was the executive director of the first executive director and founder of the African Cultural Center. Another show that I found out about in an interesting way was uh, Take a Look, 
which was hosted by a lady by the name of Juanita Young. I had seen Juanita Young's name on a lot of, in a lot of different areas, and honestly, I thought she was another reporter. But when I posted the ad, the the when I was advertising the Soul of Buffalo TV as the, as an upcoming original production, I got correspondence from her daughter, Marsha Allen, and she sent me. She subsequently would send me some information on on her mother, and as I looked over it, I was flabbergasted. You know, I I had no idea she was she was the community liaison, and she actually had her own talk show, and I had already done done the Solar Buffalo TV piece, and I'm just like, oh my God, how did how did I overlook this? But what I did was um, I put a picture of her in the show and I mentioned her by name, and then I decided that I was going to do a separate piece focusing on Miss Young and her show. And because I, I told, I remember telling your daughter, you, your mother had, to, and, and there's, you can see that on the Buffalo History Channel. It's Take a Look, the Juanita Young story. And I told her daughter, your mother had the best job in the station. She got. She had all the best interviews. She was in there with Hubert. Interviewed Hubert Humphrey, Jesse Jackson, uh, Thelma from Good Times, Bernadette Stannis. Putting Soul of Buffalo TV together, um, I decided that the angle that I wanted to take would would differ from that of what I would have done from on the B on the BC TV Tonight level. Is I would I had designed it to focus on not just who the reporters on the news were but mainly on some of the black-oriented television shows that came on during that, at that time because you, there were just so many of them. And there were there, I mean, we talk about who the reporters were a lot, but we rarely make mention of what some of those community shows, some of those shows that dealt with the, the issues of the community at that time. We rarely have any mention of them. And um, I was lucky enough to have pictures and at least a little bit of footage of what some of those shows were and um, I was glad to ultimately uh, be able to um, pull that together so um, that too turned out to be a very popular piece on the Buffalo History Channel so the soul of Buffalo TV is on on there Please check it out. Last year, Buffalo had a uh, rather interesting mayoral campaign. And uh, it, it, it not only, it so interesting that it got national attention. And while that is not presently on the books to do, the idea did, did pop up in my head to take a look back at the first African-American individual to run for mayor in the city of Buffalo. Throughout the years, a number of people have made those campaigns. But who was the first? And the first one was a man by the name of Ambrose Lane. Now, I really hadn't thought to really cover any kind of political stories on the platform, even though I knew that eventually, as as the channel grow, as the platform grows, we'll probably have to go into that area. The whole story of Ambrose Lane's campaign is uh, still in the works. It's uh, still being researched. I've read up a on a few things here and there. Not sh too sure of when it's exactly going to be released, but it will be released. Uh, it's quite a, from what I've seen already, it is quite an interesting story. I'm still trying to think about what type of angle I'm going to take towards it. But that will be the next uh, original production on the uh, 
Buffalo History Channel. And yes, I am aware of, because I'm sure I'm going to get correspondence on this. Of course, I'm aware of Arthur O. Eve's campaign for mayor. Uh, information has also been collected on that campaign. I won't say, not going to give, I won't say anything further about that, but we do have information on that. So that'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but right now, the focus is going to be on Ambrose Lane and his campaign for mayor. Um, quite an interesting story. It'll be our first uh, official political story. So whenever, whenever you're doing, when you're tackling something for the first time, you definitely want to make sure that you know you got all your bases covered, all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. You know, so it's um, not sure what's going to come of it, but I'm I'm hoping that it's just as uh, compelling and draws just as much interest as the previous five original productions on the channel. What goes into putting together an original production is a painstaking amount of research, reading, uh, fact-checking, um, one thing that I am serious on, I try to be as factual as possible. Uh, not always an easy thing to do, depending on the story that you're telling, because there's always going to be opinions on what people think are missing. But you do what you can do to um, try to put out the most the best version of a story that you can. Um, when I put these things together, my intent is not to do it in a way that disparages anybody. I don't, I try to be as, I try to put it together in a general and generic way. I try to, you don't try to put your, put your own opinions and stuff. You know, you want to make it you try to be as neutral and objective as you possibly can be. And um, hopefully we've been, I mean, been able to do that. I mean, people have, there hasn't been any complaints about anything. And uh, that's, uh, that's just something that's really important to me. Now, it, on a personal note, it gives me an opportunity to uh, do the things that I like to do. It gives me an opportunity to research. It gives me an opportunity to write. It gives me an opportunity to do voiceovers, you know, do some voiceover work. I'm not, I mean, I'm not really on camera doing anything on camera like I'm doing right now. Like, I'm, I'm not doing anything on camera to present these stories. I mean, that's not the way that I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it in a different way, in more of a news package type of type of fashion. That was, that was my... Put it as like a as a long form news feature package, package feature or whatever, whatever, whichever you want to call it. That's the way that I wanted to present the original productions on the Buffalo History Channel. Just judge, wanted to draw something from the experience that I had working in television for the years that I worked in television. The shoulders that I stand on are the shoulders of giants giants like the name you, you when I think of when I when I say that word these are men that you know in in the industry before me uh, the first name that comes to mind is Henry Hampton of Blackside Incorporated I didn't the man the, the man the spirit behind the legendary Eyes on the Prize series. Um, the work that that man has done has been just amazing. And then that takes me back to when I did the uh, Build documentary. The Build documentary film series is a was directly inspired by the Eyes on the Prize series. And when I've looked at pieces on Henry, 
on Mr. Hampton. That man has just done, even to see, to see the images of him, the behind the scenes images of him putting that incredible piece together, that, that incredible se two part se that series of, of documentaries of various stories from the civil rights movement. The fact that he sat down and did all those and filmed all those interviews with all these icons, with Coretta Scott King, with Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, Huey P. Newton. So many, so many folks. If you anybody who's seen Eyes on the Prize series, you know how impactful that has been for for a generation. For generations, I should say, you know, and um, when I look at that and I look at what I've done with the Build series, it's, I'm proud of the fact that I'm, that I'm able to now extrapolate what he's done with what I've done. I look at the, the images of him working on Eyes on the Prize. I look at the image of me and what I did with the build series and it's just so it's um they're amazingly there's just so many amazing similarities that it just it just makes me so proud that you know i i mean to know that i i just tailored a piece of my work after that and that it and it's in the build series within the city of buffalo has been over the years has been equally as impactful you know, it's some of the things, so much that, so much has grown out of that series that, you know, it, it's inspired so many things. People that have, people have gotten into activism. People have gotten into filmmaking. People have gotten into, you know, involved more people have gotten been, been inspired to get involved with the Juneteenth festival and bring it into the 21st century we just did a video on the Buffalo History Channel about it you know and it's just it may it may it, it just really makes me proud you know for something that I had because getting into filmmaking that it it, it wasn't something that I had intended to do like I said, I was interested in being a commercial producer, producing commercials. I, could, I would look at being a commercial producer. I was, I'd have been happy doing that. I'd have been happy being a television programmer, being in charge of TV programming. And I didn't get a chance to do either of those, but I, had, but I created a chance for me to do this. And I'm just happy to see that these opportunities have been as impactful as they have been. I want to also give a shout out to a few more giants upon whose shoulders I stand. I proudly stand. Uh, those names are William Greaves, um, Lou House, and uh, Tony Brown. You know, the three of these brothers, they worked on a show back in the day called Black Journal. And um, I've had a chance online to see a lot of those shows. And the way those shows are, what makes those shows so unique is it was that they were, first of all, historic, historically speaking, that show basically, shows like, Black Journal and shows like Soul, which were ho hosted by Ellis Hayslip, that those shows came about on the heels of the riots that took place in the '60s, and then the after that, the Kerner Commission came about, and as a result, there was a there was an interest through the through, through our government to identify the issues that were going on in the black community in black communities all across the nation and that's how those shows came about you know and um when they did black journal and what was so unique about it is they took a television show a tv news magazine 
and they shot because William Greaves he was a he was a William Greaves was a filmmaker, and they 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 bought they bought the flavor of filmmaking to a television show, and they put that into their news stories, and then and you know the imagery and the and also you're looking at at that time you know that was a time when you know we we really it was that was a time of black pride black power black power black pride you know people had had the afros and hair out the <laughs> had the afros you had the red black and green you had the dashikis on and you know you see a lot of that imagery that they that they put into that show. I mean, all you got to do is watch those episodes on YouTube, and it's it's just so it's so fascinating. Even over fifty some odd years later, to even look at that, to look at that, and you could there's things that you could juxtapose to today. Some of the same issues they covered then are the same issues that are at at, at hand today. I can't say enough of how proud I've been of how this platform has progressed over this short period of time. Um, some of the pieces that I put on, you know, I put these pieces on and um, I do these podcasts. I do these these little mini documentaries and I never always know what the reaction is going to be with everyone that I put on. Some things impact, some things don't do as well as others. Um, I don't even want to single out anything. It's just been, um, I just like the fact that so many, that it's, that it's just generated the response that it's generated and that it's made the impact with people that it's had. I mean, people have, it has, it has literally stirred up emotions in people. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they were, they look at some of these pieces and they're brought to tears. It, it's, it floors me every single time, man, because I mean, for something that I hadn't intended to make it into and to see it become so much more than what I thought it was going to be. We got over a thousand subscribers. Um, I, I remember saying to myself, if this thing could get at least a thousand subscribers, that's when I know that that's when I that's when I, when I will know that I've got something. And um, the responses that I've been getting have just been amazing. And it's opened up a lot. It's opened up a lot more doors. You know, I'm working with college students. I'm working with uh, the colleges and the college community in Buffalo, the educational system. It's really, the future is really, really bright for this platform. I didn't think I would be a content creator. Hadn't planned on it. I didn't think I would even be doing, I don't live in Buffalo anymore. So it's kind of strange that I'm still doing stuff for Buffalo like this. But this has really turned out to be such a blessing in disguise and i am just so grateful for this opportunity because it gives me an opportunity to do something that i've i mean a lot of these stories are stories that i've always wanted to do and i was always trying to find a way to parlay this documentary work on buffalo into something so i just look forward in the future to ex putting out more stories and expanding the platform. And I thank all of you for watching.